Okay, hi everyone. Thanks so much for tuning in. My name is Karun Sagi. I oversee Trama UI's partnerships with higher education, um, and I'm thrilled to have David Julin of Bentley University with me today. Uh, David is a user experience consultant at the User Experience Center at Bentley University. Uh, David's an expert on UX strategy, testing and assessment, design and business. He has overseen over 30 UX projects with a variety of clients. Um, some of them include the American Student Assistants, Analog Devices, Eastern Bank, Fidelity Investments, Mass Mutual, among several others. Um, in addition to client work, David also teaches online UX research tools in the UX uh, User Experience Certificate Program at Bentley University. Um, I highly encourage you to check out his blog. Um, www.davidjulin.com where he posts his ideas and thoughts on UX. During the webinar, please feel free to tweet at us at TramaUI and at J David Julin um, to ask questions or share ideas or comments. Um, we'll have about 10 minutes towards the end to answer your questions. Um, David, I'll hand this over to you. Thank you so much for, for uh, leading this webinar. Thank you, Karen. So, as I mentioned, my name is David Julien, and I'm just going to reiterate a few things about me before we get started. So, so I work at Bentley University at their User Experience Center, and we're a global consultancy group. So we work with external clients, and we're affiliated with the university. So some of the clients that we have here uh, Karen mentioned a few. Some of the others are uh, Philips, Siemens, Cisco, CA Technology, Ericsson, Payless, TD Banks. We work with all these different clients worldwide. I also help out a bit with Journal of Usability Studies. I help there with their marketing. And then, as you mentioned, I also have my own blog. And in the bottom of all of these uh, slides, you're going to see a few handles for Twitter. So you have the Bentley User Experience Center, you have Trema UI, and then you also have my own. So as we get started here, I just want to talk very briefly in general about strategy and tactics. So often you have a goal, and it's just a future desired state. Then you have the strategy, that's basically the approach or kind of how you're going to get to that state. And then you have the tactics. That's basically about the specific actions that's going to align with the strategy to get you to that goal. So in this example here, I just took for an airline, and their main, main goal is to make money for the shareholders. And for example, the CEO says, we have a low-cost airline. That's his means to reach that goal. That's his strategy. And then you may have this uh, marketing CMO that uh, he has says that, okay, we need to keep the marketing costs down in order to be the low-cost airline. So that can be seen as a tactic uh, for that strategy. But if you look a bit further down, for example, the VP of marketing, when he sees we need to keep, keep the expenses down, that's kind of a goal for him. And the strategy that he devises, we need to generate word-of-mouth marketing. But for the people higher up, that's actually just a tactic. So it depends on what level you are in the organization if you see some things as a strategy or a tactic. So what I'm going to be talking primarily about today is these different levels of UX strategies. And I'm going to dig into those different levels a bit. And before we jump into that, I just want to go through and go over what the different type of levels are now. So you get a general overview of it before we jump in. And this is just a framework, and most of what we're going to be going over today, it's kind of frameworks to, to understand and how you can build up strategies. But in order to build up a strategy, you need to understand where the company is and how you, like your desired state and how you're going to. So if we look at the global level, this is basically how the industry interacts with other industries. And the basic check that you need to do here is just you don't want to screw over your own industry. It, it rarely happens by improving the user experience. But I also want to give one example. 
So let's consider you're a grocery store and you have multiple different stores. But you want to make sure that you can buy from your suppliers. So for example, you want to get tomatoes cheaper. And you come up with this new way, new system to allow the farmers to see how much they will get for their crop on your website. By doing that, you hope that these people who sell on the farmer's market, they're going to come and sell to your store instead. So you devise this. But all of your competitors, once you launched it, are launching the exact same system. So now all of a sudden, all the farmers plus your previous suppliers, they can see what they can gain from all these different stores. And this can actually result in an unproductive price war between you and your competitors. So that is one way that you could accidentally screw up your industry. Uh, this is one of the levels we're only going to touch very briefly, and then we're going to do it in the beginning, and then we're going to dig into the other ones that I find a bit more interesting later on. So whenever you look at the industry, it's basically about your position in the industry. Are you a Mercedes and you need really good user experience? Or are you more of a Dodge and it's maybe not that important? As well as what industry are you in? If you're a steel manufacturer, maybe user experience isn't that important. If you then look at the company level, so now you already identify kind of where you want to be, how good user experience you actually should strive for. So now you need to start to deliver on that level. Here you need to look at the company structure. Where have you placed your user experience division? Do you, does it even exist? Uh, is it a kind of agency in-house or is it dispersed throughout the organization? For example, if you identify that UX is critical, but you have it all outsourced. You have a huge issue here. The next one is to start looking at the UX division. So for example, the processes you're using, the staffing. So for example, if you're just starting up and start to get going, you may only have a very small UX division. And most of the work you actually need to outsource. How should this division be devised? Maybe you should only have a few researchers that can evaluate what others have delivered to you before you put it in front of your customers. And finally, we're just going to look a bit at the project level. And basically, how good does the UX really need to be in this specific project? Can you use, for example, bullshit personas, or do you need to use really rigorous personas? So let's start to look at the global level. So often, as I said before, you don't really need to do that much analysis here because most of the times you're not going to screw over your own industry. Uh, and I've just used Porter's Five Forces here. And that's not usually done in this type of analysis. It's more to see if an industry is beneficial or not. But I have modified it a slight bit just to focus on user experience. But before I go there, I just want to give another example. So if you have five milk farmers, they all have one cow each, and each cow produces one unit of milk. If one of those farmers goes and buys another cow, so he's producing two units, and the rest are producing one unit, his profit is a, has gone up a slight bit. But the price for milk in general has probably gone down, so everybody else is making a slight bit less. The result of this is probably that every other milk farmer is going to go and get another cow. So now all of them have two cows, and you just multiply the supply by two. Most likely the prices on milk have dropped. So depending on how much the price dropped, if they're unfortunate, the, the price dropped to half of it. And now they're making the same amount of revenue, but they have more expenses. For example, they need to feed the cows, and they have no, more work to do when they're milking the cows. So they actually made the industry worse off by doing it. However, if they change the entire industry structure, they can actually be better off. So for example, if they have more power uh, when they're selling their milk to the dairy companies, then they can actually be better off. 
and it may not have been resulting in a worse off as we thought from start. So I'm just going to look at the five different pieces here and mention like how UX could improve or help the industry. So for example, for suppliers, increased UX, can it generate more suppliers that more people want to interact with your company and the industry as a whole? For the buyers, can increased UX uh, result in that they value your products and services higher and they just want to pay more for them? And therefore, there's going to be more money into the industry. For the new entrances, uh, it, this one, you need to think about UX in two different ways. You have the one that some people look at UX and they just see like an interface, and it's all that. Uh, I see UX as a way bigger part. It's almost like customer experience. And that's how it was originally defined by Don Norman. Uh, if you see it as this broader one, all of those smaller pieces, like the interface, that is easy to replicate for any new entrances. But if you look at it as a whole, the process you're using to generate those awesome interfaces, if you look at the back end, the support, the customer uh, relationship, when you're sending out emails and all of them, those processes are going to be more difficult to mimic. And therefore, you're actually going to build up better uh, barriers to new entrances within the industry. If you look at the substitutes, uh, an example we can look at is uh, if you're in the train industry and, and the substitute would be the airline. So for example, I live in Boston and I can go down to New York. It's roughly the same time for me to take a train compared to flying with all the security check and all of those pieces. If the uh, train companies now on their uh, trains created small rooms for me where I could actually work and do my work and I'm uh, kept away from anybody else. I maybe have even a computer screen there that I could connect my laptop to. I maybe have a phone there. For me, that would be a way better experience and the substitutes would be way less attractive to me. And then if we look at the rivals within the industry, if there is in general a low uh, UX level here, if you actually improve the level of UX, you can actually take a lot of market shares pretty fast. So that's all I'm going to be talking about the global. So we can move in instead and talk about the specific industry level. So here, this is a basic framework as well. So you can basically be the cost leader or you can try to hoard differentiation. So you have here, for example, Hyundai and BMW. If you're the cost leader, you need to do UX cheaper because you should not blow the entire company budget on the UX. However, if you're approaching the differentiation, the BMW, it's the experience. Like you want to have a good drive. It's not just the infotainment. It's like the entire part about buying a BMW. Get the car be served. All of that is super important here. And then you can also have a focused or you can have a broad market. For example, you have Hyundai. You can take the car and drive it all over the country. The smart car is more focused, for example, on the city and dense traffic. And the Ferrari is more for the people who has extra money to buy a car for pleasure that they have on the side. And what you need to understand about the broad and focused market is that it has an impact on your UX research. If you have a focused market, you can actually do cheaper UX research because now you only need to market uh, research that specific segment. So for example, if you're a national bank, you only need to do the research within that country. On the other hand, if you're a, world bank, a worldwide bank, now you need to do research in multiple, multiple countries. And that's going to be more uh, pricey. And the other part, as I mentioned before, what industry are you actually in? I took the vehicle car manufacturing here, but if you're in the steel industry, maybe it's smart to be more for the low cost compared for differentiation. Another way to look at all of this is to look at factors of competition. Uh, this is actually from Harvard Business Review. And you can see the different type of factors to compete on. So the traditional airline is they have some up and downs, but they're kind of in the middle. 
Southwest, on the other hand, they have identified what factors are most important to them. So, for example, they keep the price down, but they also keep meals, launches, and so on low. But they keep the friendly service, the speed, and frequent departures very high. So, where would you expect uh, Southwest to actually have their user experience? Because if they have it very low, they can do it cheaply, and that would make their price point for the ticket to actually maybe be even lower. If they do it higher up, the value by the customers are going to be perceived higher than what they're actually paying. We'll take a look at that a bit more here. So this is from Forrester Research, and what we can see here is that people are willing to pay for an excellent customer experience. And uh, something I can mention here is that they used customer experience here, but I see it exactly the same as UX, so I say it's kind of transferable. And you can actually see that the airline industry is one of these ones they investigated that has the highest impact. So Southwest should probably invest and make sure they have a high user experience overall because then the customers are going to perceive their value of the ticket way higher. Another thing you can do is to look at another framework. This is also from Forrester Research. So if you look to the left, you have the customers, if they're trapped or if they're free. So for example, if you take an electricity utility company, you may only have one to pick from. So you are very trapped as a customer. Compared to if you look at grocery stores or retailers, you may be able to just walk across the street to go to a competitor. And then if you look at the other one, you have the competitor's customer experience. So basically, does everybody have the same, or is it more differentiated? And then you can map out where your company is, or where you would expect to find it. And then on the next slide, you can kind of start to think about how you need to play within these different industries. So if you're in the top right, this is where online retailers are. And the customers are free to leave however they want. It's very simple. They just open another tab in the browser. And the UX is super important in this industry. So it's very differentiated. So here you need to focus on dominating one segment. Don't try to win everybody. If you, on the other hand, is in the top left, that means that you are basically everybody have the same kind of UX. But customers are free to leave. So if you actually make a UX investment in this industry, you can take a lot of customers from the other competitors before they catch up. Uh, one example of this is Whole Foods. They have created a better customer experience, and therefore they still can grow market shares. Uh, another less known in the same industry is actually Publix. Uh, they, what they have done is basically they flood the floor with employees. So if you have a problem finding anything, have any questions, it's very easy to find somebody to ask, and then they're all obviously trained to provide good service. And both of those companies are actually outperforming the industry last time I saw. And if you, on the other hand, is in the bottom left corner, so basically you're trapped. So if it is these utility companies, if you come up with some type of disruption, so if it is to provide electricity, maybe you come up with some sensors that can laser beam it to the different houses, and you don't need to have this huge investment cost. If you also can provide a great customer experience, a lot of people are going to move from their providers and just come over to your company. You can take giant market shares once again. If you look at the bottom right corner, Right now, you have nothing there, and it kind of makes sense. You don't really want to be there, because if the market is trapped, there's only one company to pick from, that's your company. You're kind of wasting your resources if you have a really good experience. Uh, here, you basically just need to make sure that you limit the, the cost of different uh, systems. For example, if uh, somebody wants to make a payment online, you don't want them to have to call customer support. So you want to make it good enough, but it is about cost at all stages in the overall part you need to look at. 
However, there's one time you need to think about this part a slightly different. If you're anticipating a disruption in your industry, if you create a really good customer experience, even though the next person or the next company is coming in there, you can actually retain a lot of your customers. So I'm going to move in and talk a bit about the company. So here I just focused on one just to show an example. So I have only focused on the interface design, so it's software. I have not taken the entire part of uh, the user experience. And I just split it into front end and back end. So basically, are you going to outsource it or are you going to keep it in-house? So if we look at the top right, that means that you keep both of them in-house. And here, experience is a critical business function. Uh, it's frequent updates. For example, Amazon, uh, I think they launched about an update every 12 seconds or something. It was a incredible speed where they made updates to their interface. You also have very low switching costs in this category. If we then look over at the top left here, so you actually keep the back end, back end in-house, but the front end you outsource. It's actually a bit unusual to be doing this, but it could be beneficial to do that. So it's, for example, if you have the design very consistent over time, and but the back end is kind of where the magic happens. This could be an approach. And one example could be search engines. If you look at the bottom left, so this is where they basically outsource everything. It's not core for the business. They, they don't understand this uh, software development as well, so it's better to outsource it. It's more of these one-off developments. It may be a very high switching cost. And here I just said example parking fines. You basically just have one in, uh, institution you can interact with. So an example of how a company in Sweden, it was an electricity company, uh, so it was not their core competency to be developing these systems. And normally what these type of companies would do, they would hire some agency, one consultancy company to design and do everything, the entire package. The thing was that they knew that they had a very messy back end um, and they also wanted to make sure it worked well. They had one person on their staff that actually understood kind of user experience and why it's important because this was their intranet. So they were really adamant on making this very efficient. And this one person, he actually spoke up and he said, like, we have a big problem to just outsource to one company because our back end is messy. So if we go to one of these companies that's really good at back end development, their front end is not going to be that great. Even if they say it, it's not their core competency. Um, and also these companies would have a very hard time scoping it and it's probably going to be a lot of late changes because they didn't really understand our requirements. And then the other option that they had, it was to go to more of this UX agency. But they weren't sure if they were actually going to be able to handle the messy backend. So they didn't feel like that was as good a choice either. And what they would suggesting us slightly was that, oh, maybe two of them can collaborate. But instead, what they decided to do was they split the project up into two. So they started with the front end and sent out this request for proposals. They hired an agency that created the front and made sure it worked well, well for the users. Uh, they made sure it worked in one browser, uh, user tested, uh, everything but hooking up the back end into that uh, one browser version. Then once they had it, that's when they sent out requests for proposals for these heavy development companies that now had a very easy time scoping it because they could see the interface, they can understand everything. And what their job was to do now was make sure it works in all browsers and also make sure that the back end is hooked up to everything. And these development companies, they actually appreciated it because it was easy for them to scope it and they didn't need to deal with this part that they were not as strong in. 
that is to user experience or the interface design. So at the end of this project, it was a huge success with minimal late changes, but it was one drawback and is that it had a bit of a dragged out time period. Because first you need to do project one, then project two. And they split it up, so they spent about 25% on the front end development, and then about 75% on the back end. And then if we also look at the bottom right corner as well. So here the front end is very important. So for example, you may have continuous UX improvements, you may need specific domain knowledge. And here, for example, you could have this when you keep the, the design in-house, the front end in-house, but you outsource the back end. So another thing you can look at at the company level, it is the UX organizational structure. And I, I got this from Nancy Dickinson and Christian Rohr. And this structure of the organization will have an impact on what UX you actually can deliver. So it actually spans a bit over two of these uh, different levels. And you can probably see a lot of these frameworks actually goes into one and the other levels. So don't see these specific levels where I put them as they have to be there. But they're somewhere around that area. And here, for example, you have the fellow centralized, you have a, two of the mixes. And then here you also have one mix, but then on the other end you have the fully distributed. So you have kind of a continuous spectrum of some sort. And you can build it up in many different ways. So here I just have a comparison of the different ones. So some of these different organizational structures are going to be stronger at some point, and some other are going to be stronger at other parts. And if we just look at an example of the fully centralized, the one first to the left, uh, when you look at if it works well in Agile and Scrum, it doesn't really, at least not when you compare it to the other one. But it doesn't mean that you can't do it. It's just that you need to find a process or method that can work in it. Uh, but you will never be as strong as the other one. So basically, whatever structure you pick, you need to understand the different strengths and weaknesses. But then you also need to uh, understand how can I overcome these weaknesses and how can I uh, maximize these benefits or the, the strong points. So I have just made one example of a mixed structure. So you have a distributed team and you have a centralized team. So the distributed UXers, they can partner with the business unit. They can provide a bit of guidance of how they should approach the project in a better way. Uh, the competences here may be that they need to be more of generalists and then get support from the central uh, organization that may have the specialists. Meanwhile, the centralized then, they may be driving more of these overarching projects that spans across products. Maybe they assist during peaks. Uh, they can also host specific functions. So for example, graphic design. So the distributed uh, generalists maybe are good at research and building kind of low-level wireframing prototypes, but they don't really get this pixel perfect. But once they get to that stage of the project, that's when they use the centralized uh, organization. And they really make sure that they, they look really good, send it back to the distributed team, they just do some final research, making sure it still works, and then they actually develop it out. Another part to this is that you can also work with the externals. I have put it here so they work primarily with the centralized unit, and the reason for that is if the centralized unit is the one that's assisting during peaks as a first part, they have a better understanding when they, they need more from the external than if the distributed teams go directly to the external ones. And the external ones can also provide a fresh set of eyes, as well as if the centralized unit doesn't have some specific competency, the external can also have that. So now I'm just going to jump into the UX division. 
but the first slide is actually expanding a bit more of them. So if you think about it, you can be outside in company or inside out. And for the outside in company, it basically look for inspiration, innovation, and so on outside the company. So they basically try to find a problem and then they try to solve it. Meanwhile, the inside out companies, they innovate within the company and then this is often technology and so on and they come up with some smart solution, but then they try to find some type of application or package it somewhere so they actually can sell it outside. And basically, they, they need to find a way to monetize it afterwards. And one example of these type of companies are often university spin-offs. So the different strategies you have here is going to have an impact on the UX. In the outside in company, UX can be driving the innovation. It can actually be seen as a revenue generator. And they're going to be a part of a leader in the company. Meanwhile, in the inside, they're going to be more of a supportive function. Once this technology has been developed, then they're supposed to package this so it's appealing and usable and people want to use it. So this can have an impact on the UX staffing. So if you're an outside in company, you may have more exciting projects. And there may be more career opportunities because the division is seen as a part of generating revenue and not as a service or cost center. And then in the inside out, you may have a slight bit more limitations of career opportunities, and therefore you may have a bit harder time to attract the top talents. Another thing I want to talk about here is kind of the, the good versus great. Like how good user experience do you really need? Uh, this also spans in multiple different levels. But do you really need to be an industry leader? Maybe you do, but maybe you don't. So if you are aiming for the best experience, you may need to do some more exploratory research and you have even more user involvement, which is going to lead to higher costs. Since you're going to hire more UX staff, you're going to have more experienced staff, but you also need to have a high enough maturity in the organization to really go there. If you look at the good enough, this can be more of a follower approach. You do some competitive analysis, you can be more a copycat. Um, so therefore you need less staff and you can actually rely a bit more on rigid processes. So you may be able to keep the cost down and actually have a bit more junior staff. For example, think about it. If you are a regional bank, can you really have the greatest industry leader experience? if you're competing with them that has maybe 10 times the budget for UX compared to you. Maybe you just need to pick your battles and specific uh, engagement. For example, you want to have the best mobile app, but all the other parts you try to approach more as a copycat. So here you can see this is from uh, Forrester Research once again, and I actually popped it back up so we're on the industry level. But I want to give a bit more background before we actually look at this. So you can see the revenue potential and how it's mapped to the customer experience index. So if you look at the retail banks, the green line, they have more of a linear relationship. There's always going to be diminishing at some point, but it's primarily linear. And here it can be more beneficial to actually be a leader because improving the customer experience actually has a relationship to the revenue potential. If you, on the other hand, is the wireless carriers, and you can see how that has a bit more diminishing return earlier. What you need to focus on here is basically avoid sucking. Because after you pass that point, it's not going to gain that much extra from being taking you from good to great to greatest. So basically, understand your industry, how it operates within UX. That can be a very big, big benefit when you're building out the UX strategy. The 
next one is um, this is basically the same as we looked at for Southwest, but here I focus on the UX division. So you have a current state and you have a desired state. And in the current state, you're more of a gatekeeper. You're kind of testing stuff just before it's going to go and be launched for your uh, customers. But the desired state, it's more innovation and more agile. So here, innovation is going to create more waste, and that's why I put the waste a bit higher up here. And when I'm talking about waste, I'm talking in the UX division. In the long run for the entire project, you're actually going to decrease the waste because you should have less late changes in the development. You can also see that they say that it's okay to work in product silence, but they do want knowledge sharing. That means that they need to work out some strategy of how they can do it. Maybe it is weekly meetings where they share the latest uh, ideas on what they find out. Um, and you can also see that they are okay with higher costs, but at the same time, they want less fluctuation in work. So if they just hire more people, there will be work fluctuations. So maybe they need to hire just a few more, and then they need to take fluctuations through consultancies. So after that, you also need to look at the capabilities. So basically, what can hold you back from actually executing these ideas and goals and strategies that you have? For example, the staff. Do you have too few, too many? Uh, do you have the right skill set? Do you need specialists? Do you need generalists? The processes you have. Basically, can you be a usability test factory? Or do you need to focus on design thinking? Basically, how can a generalist get help from a specialist? And also, when in the process is UX even considered? Can you have an impact on getting even earlier? You also need to figure out how you're going to get input from your users. And you need to work with a few recruiters. Do you have beta users? Uh, can you do internal research? And you also need to look at equipment. Do you need a usability lab? Can you use some online tools? So you just need to find out what can hold you back here. So this is just an example from a process that could be used. I'm not saying that this is the one that you need to use, but if you have put up this process on the UX division level. That means that most projects aim to have this type of product, uh, process. It doesn't mean that every product will have exactly this process. But here you can see that they start to compare the competitors, they may create two designs, next iteration is one design, and then they create a final design that, they, that work good enough. If you compare that to more of an innovation UX, have different ideas, and that goes into different concepts. You create some design, you go broad, you create even more designs. Then you coming uh, narrow it down. At a point, you start to compare to the competitors, and then you move on. And I actually couldn't fit more into this slide, but it may be even way more. And even if both of these ones try to be as lean as possible, the first one will be a cheaper version compared to this one. And this one would probably create more innovation and, in the end, a better user experience for the company. So now if we just look at the project level, so if you see within this box in blue, this was some process that we were discussing back a few years here at the User Experience Center. And, um, you basically have some business goals, some customer goals going into this project. Then you're evaluating a few different initiatives that you could do. And you put it into a time plan. You know that this is not the real time plan that's actually going to be executed. But you have an idea. You have an estimate at that point. And then you conduct the UX initiatives. And then as you're conducting the first initiative, you're going to update the business goals. You're going to evaluate your initiatives. Maybe you need to change some stuff and the time plan actually need to change. And then it just iterate. And on the side, outside the project, you may have a knowledge library. So whenever you conduct some research, you're actually finding insight about the users. You share it with the library where the rest of the UX division can access it. 
or other units like marketing and sales can access it. And maybe the, when the time comes and you want to do personas, maybe they already exist and you can just use them. So this is just a framework how a project could be run. And, and then I also want to go through this small framework. So this is about the top piece of the previous picture about business goals and user goals. So it all starts with the business having some type of uh, goals. For example, if we take an online candy store. It may be that they want to increase the sales. Maybe they want to get more traffic to the site. Uh, they may want to decrease fluctuations in sales throughout the year. And then you have different user groups. For example, it may be the kids, then it may be the parents, and then it may, may be the grandparents. And all these user groups have different goals. Some overlap, some are unique. So for example, if the first group is the kids, their goals may be that they want to find the new coolest candy as well as buying it. And then the user group too that may be their parents. They may want to know what's in these candies before they buy it. If you don't know about user goal number three, that is finding out what's in the candy, you can actually lose a lot of sales because that's a crucial piece of information before they make the purchase. And then if you look at user group three, maybe they are the one that's want to be baking with cookies. So you may actually have some blog where you um, write about new cool recipes of candy. But if you realize later on that they have no intention of purchasing candy from you, this is kind of complete useless to be signing for this group. So therefore, you should focus on group one and group two. So basically, identifying these pieces going into a project, it can be very beneficial. So that was my presentation. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, David. That was such a good presentation. Um, I loved when you used uh, the examples of Amazon, Whole Foods, in other case studies, um, it really helps understand what you were talking about. Thank you. Uh, we do have some questions um, from the audience that I'd like you to address. You hinted at a few of them, uh, but just to reiterate, um, it'd be good to talk about it to wrap up. Um, first, yep. what metrics should a business use to measure their UX strategy after recognizing what level their company operates at? So. There's a few things that I want to mention about that. Um, so first off, a company should consider the UX on all levels. Uh, but it may not be the case because some companies have not got there. So they are only working, for example, within the project level. It may only be one project out of all their projects they're having. Uh, so they need to, to basically grow that in general. And I also want to, to focus on another part of this question. And that is, how basically, are they talking about measuring their strategy or not? Because I don't see it as if you create three different strategic approaches to measure how they would compare against one another, because you will only execute one of them. So what I'm going to look into, or I can kind of answer here, is more if you have a strategy. So how do you make sure you make progress on your strategy? How do you make sure you, you push the needle forward in, in the right direction? So I think that may be more valuable to people to listen to. But So there's a few things that you need to consider on all levels, and then there's a few that you should consider on specific levels. So the one thing that would span across all levels it's basically that you need to measure the progress. That means that you need to benchmark it. So you need to establish benchmarks on multiple levels as well as against competitors. And therefore, you need a standardized way to measure it. And to be honest, so far, there's not that really good standardized measurements. Uh, for example, there is a track diff that's trying to to measure some of the user experience. Uh, you have the net promoter score that's trying to do the entire company 
and how likely it is to be recommended. You have the system usability scale, but I don't think there's any really good measurement. So here I think um, you basically need to, to come up with your own uh, your own benchmark, your own score that you're going to be using. Uh, so you basically need to deconstruct what UX means for your industry. Is it to be a pleasurable experience? Uh, is it a desire for customers to do business with you again? For Disney, for example, it may be about memories. Meanwhile, for a bank, it may be something about trust. But you need to deconstruct it, what it actually means. So that's just general. So if we look at the global level, basically what you could do is you can benchmark your industry compared to other industries and see how your industry is moving forward or not. Just keep in mind that you don't have that much impact on the industry in general. If you push UX further, most likely your competitors in the industry are going to mimic you. So you may push it a bit, but you don't have the ultimate control over the industry. If, if you go down to the industry level, uh, now you actually look at your different companies that's operating, they're basically competitors. If you have the follower strategy, for example, so now you need to look, are your UX scores close to the uh, best ones? And compared to the other companies that are taking this follower approach, are you beating them? And basically, how do you compare over time? And you also need to consider how much you are spending on UX. Because if you're taking a follower strategy, you should try to be spending less. If you're the leader, on the other hand, uh, you basically need to see if you have the best UX uh, or customers are willing to pay it. If you have company level, basically are you moving towards the, the structural that you aim to be? For example, if you're fully centralized and you want to find a matrix, are you moving the needle in the right direction? So there's basically on all these different levels, there's definitely ways that you can measure it. Um, for example, just on that company level, you can see if you're trying to push innovation, have the UX division succeeded to generate three different innovative projects? Have these projects led to any revenue once they got launched? And how many projects have the division been able to participate in? So you have all on these different levels. Um, I bet we have other questions. I don't want to keep on dwelling on this one. Sure. Um, David, you said that you look at UX, you focus on UX on all these levels, but when you look at the overarching business strategy, um, when, is, when is it safe to overlook UX? Uh, I, I think it's, it's never safe to overlook UX, but I think it can be done prioritized. I think you also always should look at it just to understand where you are, what business you're in, what industry, and so on, and like, just to, to get understand the importance. But I, I would never just completely let it go. But back to your questions. So a few times when you may be able to downplay it, when your industry is far from uh, creating experiences, and price is the, the primary driver. For example, if you're dealing with commodities, price is the primary factor. Uh, not the experience as much. Uh, just keep in mind here when I say these things, um, you still need to have decent customer service. Like the representatives that are selling and talking to the buyer agents, uh, they need to deliver good service. But you may not need to invest as much as Disney, for example. Uh, you also have another part, that is when you have limited competition. So it can be, for example, patents and usage rights. Uh, or it can also be like governmental re uh, regulations. So for example, utility companies, they may not need to have aspirate. The same governmental agencies, what, what is more important for these is to make sure that the usability is good because they don't want the uh, customer support calls. But it doesn't need to be this delightful, this awesome user experience. So they may be able to down prioritize that as well. Um, and then once, as I said before, like, if you have a smaller budget, I wouldn't say that you can't completely ignore the UX, but you may need to to really think wisely about how you spend your UX budget. 
Excellent. Thanks, David. Um, also looking at the business overall, um, UX is 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 a significant uh, role in the success of a business, um, especially startups as well. But how can UX strategy boost a company's sales? Uh, I, I think the easiest way to think about this is from an economist perspective. So let's say you're creating a product and it costs $10 to create. Uh, and then the next thing you're trying to figure out is how much can you charge for this? What, what are, do customers value this product? So let's say it's an average $100. Some are going to be willing to pay 110 Some are only willing to pay 90 But you have some average. At this point, most companies, they would just start to put some accountant in there. They need to crunch out the exact specific uh, best sweet spot number to, to price the product. Um, but let's say we just say that $100 is what people value it. That doesn't mean that I think you should price it at $100 because you are creating a kind of value gap between the cost of creation and cost of like what the value actually is. So there's a lot of gap in between. And if you, for example, price it on 90 instead or even 80, the user actually gets more value, or the customer that's buying it again. Uh, you are taking away from the business and the value that they uh, create, and that's going to be a fight with the accountant. But you actually have reasons for doing this. For whoever the customer is, and they're buying it, it's less risk, because it's cheaper to buy. And the product is going to over-deliver value, because they actually value it at $100, but you actually sell it for 80 so you gave them a value of $20. That means that they're going to do word of mouth marketing for you, and that means you're going to see a more rapid growth. So sometimes it's actually better to, to price something a slight bit lower. It's, it, within pricing, it, it actually comes in a lot more about how the brand is perceived and so on, but you have something to think about it. Sometimes you actually want to lower it, and if I tie this back to UX, a great user experience actually give more value to the user in the end. And that's why uh, it's actually a really good strategy for a company to, to focus on. And in the end, what the company does, if they increase the price so they can just make a higher profit, or if they prefer to try to do what I say, like a more rapid growth, it's up to the company in the end. But the UX, in the end, create a higher value perception of the product. Right, David, I couldn't agree more. Um, I actually read a few studies where uh, they say that millennials, which is a bulk of um, target markets for so many companies, are willing to pay more um, for products and services with great experiences. And of course, UX is an experience in itself. Um, and that just Absolutely. is important that is. Yeah, and some of the slides that I showed uh, course, the research have shown that people are willing to pay a price premium for a customer experience and user experience. So, exactly. And tying it back to UX again, um, one last question we have is that should UX be a key differentiator on all levels um, as opposed to being um, more relevant and more important on specific levels that you mentioned? So, I don't know if I would use the word differentiator, but I see it as the goal should be to have a clear purpose on each level. And then each subsequent level need to support kind of that purpose. And the process that you build further and further down need to all tie into a nice chain that's supporting the overarching part. Um, so, so for example, if you're aiming to be the leader in your industry, um, you not really be differentiating as much uh, on that level. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> you will be differentiating a lot if you're trying to be the industry leader. But then it also means that the process is further down. If you aim to be the industry leader, your processes on the company level, on the division and the project, those processes need to be better than the competitors that also aim to be the industry leader. So it kind of, yes, you need to somewhat, if you want to use the word differentiate, 
So your process internally need to be a bit more superior and differentiated as well further down compared to the competitor. So I also just want to say, sometimes I've been talking about this being a follower, and uh, maybe the UX on the cheaper version. I just want to make sure that I get this message across. And it's, for most industries, it's still beneficial to aim for be a UX leader and take that role, and, and not just doing everything on the cheap and trying to be a follower. Right. Well, David, thank you so much for answering the questions and for the presentation. Um, excellent sure. insights. Um, I really thank enjoyed it. That. I'm sure our listeners enjoyed it too. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Um, we'll sign off here and um, have a great week ahead. Thank you.